Thank you for attending our session on spring data and in-memory data management in action. My name is John Bloom, and with me today is my good friend and colleague, Luke Shannon. Good morning. I'm on the spring data team, and I also work on, well, I'm the lead for the spring data Gemfire spring data geode project. Luke is a pivotal uh, platform. platform architect and helps customers with PCF and Gemfire deployments. And I'm going to bring the two of those together today, Gemfire and PCF. <laughs> today we're going to give you kind of a quick overview uh, what and why for Apache Geode, how it fits into the Spring ecosystem. And then we're just going to get right to it. We're going to skip all the fluff and uh, show you how to use Geo, Gemfire in your Spring application. So we're going to put it in action. Um, Luke's going to show you how to use Gemfire Geode as a caching provider in Spring's cache abstraction. Then he's going to follow that up with uh, events using continuous query, how our application can consume those. Then I'm going to kind of cover some data access patterns using the Spring Data uh, Commons repository abstraction and how it actually is kind of specific to Gemfire and Geode. There's a little bit of differences between all the modules, so I want to share with you some of those differences. And then finally, we're going to cover some of the new improvements and the latest releases, as well as um, take a look at what's next. And I kind of have a bonus feature that I'm excited to share with everyone. I hope we have enough time to, to get with that. Um, and then we'll finish up with some Q&A. So first, we need to kind of maybe set the tone a little bit. How many people have actually used Gemfire or Geode? OK, a few people. Good. How many people have actually used Spring Data Gemfire or Geode to actually access it? So what's the difference between Geode and Gemfire? Well, not a whole lot. There's a few feature differences. But underneath the hood, they're really the same thing. Last year, Pivotal donated the source code for Gemfire to the Apache Software Foundation as an open source project. And it's been incubating ever since. So essentially, they're one and the same thing. And you can use either or. However, there are a few differences in terms of features. Geode's got a few more new uh, um, bells and whistles that Gemfire doesn't have. And eventually, Gemfire is going to be rebased on Geode, its code base. Um, and there's a few things that are still struggling behind on the, Geo, on the Gemfire side that haven't made it to open source, like native client stuff. So in the past, we've tried to describe what Gemfire is, what it is, how it works. And invariably, that works either pretty well or not so well, because some people are very experienced with in-memory data grids, and other people aren't. So some of those concepts people miss, and other people, they're like, oh, I've heard this before. This is boring. I don't want to hear it again. So to this year, I just put together a slide that kind of just, it's a word graph that just kind of highlights what it is in a nutshell. First and foremost, it's an in-memory data grid, so it stores your data in memory. And by memory, I mean the JVM heap. Uh, there is an option in Geo to store data in off heap, um, which hasn't made it to Gemfire yet. But once Gemfire is rebased on Geo, it will. Uh, but obviously, if you have a large data set, not all your data is going to fit in memory. So it's a grid. It's going to scale out. And the data is going to be distributed across the cluster. Gemfire can be persistent. But uh, essentially, you want to have your data in memory so you have that low latency access to it, high throughput, right? a lot faster than disk. But when you start introducing the network, obviously, you can introduce failures like network problems. And so the architecture has to be very resilient to those failures, um, both in terms of making your data available and keeping with consistency. So Gemfire always favors consistency over availability. Your data is still available, but in a kind of a reduced fashion in order to preserve consistency. Gemfire has been used historically in a lot of financial applications. Therefore, consistency is kind of important in financial transactions. Um, but it still tries to remain, maintain availability. It does that by distributing your data, replicating your data, actually creating redundancy and, and so on. But there's all those also other features that describe an in-memory data grid. Um, you have querying. You need a way to access your data. You can index it so you can speed those queries up. You can create functions for distributed compute, aggregates those results, and brings it back to your node. It supports transactions. It has its own serialization framework. Um, there's a lot of overhead in Java I.O. serializable. Uh, but Gemfire does support that. 
However, in order to actually support native clients and other language clients, it has its own PDX serialization format. So not only can you use this through Java applications, you can also use this with your .NET applications. Um, it's a shared nothing architecture, so in terms of failure, there's no single point of failure, right? Uh, it can load up the data from any node and distribute that and rebalance and, uh, and heal itself. It supports your traditional topologies, client server. That's usually the most common pattern that we see. But also you can actually embed a Gemfire instance cache inside your application. So literally your application becomes a member of the cluster. There's some advantages and obviously disadvantages to that. One advantage being that your application is very close to the data because it's hosting the data. Uh, but obviously it puts additional um, pressure on the, uh, the JVM heap, of course. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail. I really want to kind of show you guys how to use it, right? But before we jump into just that, so the Spring Data Gemfire project was created to actually bring Spring's consistent, non-powerful uh, programming model to Gemfire and Geode. So it helps you simplify the configuration and development of applications that actually use these platforms. But more importantly, it actually gives you the ability to tie Geode and Gemfire into the larger Spring ecosystem. And let's look, take a look at a few ways in which that occurs today. So obviously everybody knows that there's the Spring transaction management infrastructure. So by using Spring Data Gemfire, you can actually take advantage of local and global transactions. Gemfire supports global transactions, JTA-based transactions. So you can use that transaction management infrastructure. Caching, I already mentioned uh, that Luke's going to do a demo on actually showing how Gemfire Geo can be used as a caching provider in Spring's cache abstraction. And because the Spring framework supports JSR 107 annotations, Gemfire and Geo can also be used as a JSR 107 provider. I mentioned a little bit about repositories. If you're creating data access objects, for basic CRUD, mapping operations, querying, especially querying, right? The repository abstraction supported in Spring Data Gemfire so you can create those data access objects. And by extension, if you're using repositories, you can combine that with Spring Data REST, Spring Hadios, and create very mature, hypermedia-driven RESTful web services. Additionally, Gemfire is used in Spring integration for both inbound and outbound channel adapters, so the cache event CQs can serve as an input and you can also write stuff back out to Gemfire in the message channels. And by extension, because Spring XD was built on Spring integration, you can use Spring XD to actually do the same thing. So the concepts are similar to source and sync for Gemfire um, to create ingest, analytical applications, streaming applications, data streaming applications using Spring XD, which has now become Spring Cloud Dataflow. You'll notice that Geode's not there yet. Um, some of the Spring ecosystem geo is still kind of spreading throughout, so you'll see places where the geo logo doesn't show up because uh, that's still kind of a work in progress. You can use it in Spring Session, so I added support in Spring Session to use it for HTTP session state replication and management. So there's an adapter there where you can plug Gemfire or Geode into that. Um, right now, just Gemfire, but there's a PR for Geode. But it, the nice thing about Spring Session, it doesn't just support HTTP, it supports web sockets and other forms of sessions. So you can use Gemfire in all those scenarios. You can use it in Spring Boot, there's a starter, so you can get up quickly, running quickly um, and easily by using annotations. And finally, there's connectors in Spring Cloud so that you can actually connect your Spring applications to uh, the Gemfire tile service and PCF. And Luke's gonna actually demo some of that stuff today. So, with that, let's get into it. Luke's going to start with the caching exam. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right. Do you want to set your stuff here? Uh, I don't want to move my laptop because okay. I'm using that MiFi in this whole thing. Gotcha. So thanks to Jim for supplying a MiFi. When you're doing a demo with a cloud environment and you don't have a stable internet, it's not a good thing. But this looks stable, but I'm not moving my laptop. Uh, OK. So what I want to show you today is Gemfire Geode uh, running in a cloud environment, specifically Pivotal Cloud Foundry. How many people here have heard of or played with Pivotal Cloud Foundry? Anyone? OK, good amount of people. Uh, my ops guy, Dan, is there. Thanks to Dan. Yeah, you. <laughs> he set up my PCF environment on AWS for me. 
Uh, it's running on AWS, could run on vSphere, um, all sorts of other IaaS, but today we'll be on AWS. Uh, so what I want to do is show you sort of the life cycle of sp spinning up a cache and then connecting to it from a programming point of view and a few patterns that, that are useful. Okay, so first off, this is where you get it. Um, so if you go to network.pivotal.io, uh, you can download Jumpfire for PCF. Now, if you've ever sort of played with Pivotal Cloud Foundry from an operations point of view, we have something called Ops Manager, which works with a, a layer called Bosch. So Bosch is what talks to the underlying infrastructure as a service. It you know, works with the VMs and basically installs Cloud Foundry within that infrastructure, but can also do things like set up services like Gemfire. So let's see, first time I click, do I have internet? Come on, yeah. Let's, let's hope that trend keeps up. So you'll see here we've got resource config. So the idea is in its current incarnation, you set up plans. So there's plan one, two, and three. So the idea is small, medium, and large. And you set up groupings of locators and servers. So I'll show you what a Jumpfire cluster looks like uh, so you can see those concepts. But the idea is I can allocate it VMs, and then I get that set up. Uh, what? what just happened? Uh, Still good? A little yeah. OK. This whole setup is very touchy. OK. So this is what the application console looks like. Um, and this is where I'm going to push my apps to, but also where I can set up my services. And you'll see I have something here called Hero Cache. Now, if I click the Manage button, I'm taken to something called Pulse. Now, what's neat is, so this is um, all the members of the gem, uh, Geode or Gemfire cluster expose GMX. And one of them is sort of a central point. Pulse can talk to that get a lot of metrics about the health of the cluster, like how many members. Uh, we can take a look at the data. Uh, whoops. So we have one region. A region's basically a hash map, and it's distributed across the members. So we can sort of take a look at that. So three members that hero region is distributed across. I'll show you how I configured this in a second. But what's nice is the tile has set up these members for me and set up this interface. So let's take a look at how I actually set up a service. Um, is that large enough? Can everyone see that? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so let's go up here. So I've got some ask yard. Um, these are the commands that I'm running. I've got a little shell script to uh, sort of automate this because sometimes I forget how to type and there's a bunch of people watching me. So it's easier to just sort of automate it. So this script basically checks. So this script basically, I've got, I'm logged in through uh, Cloud Foundry's command line interface. So this allows me through a CLI to issue REST commands and basically talk to the Cloud Foundry that you see in this browser. So I just did a listing of apps, and sure enough, there's my caching example. So this is what I'm plugged into. And if I do CF services, I can see in my space I have a hero cache. And if I do CS service hero cache, you can see all the details that I need to work with this cache have been provided. So there's a URL to Pulse. Everything is set up for me. Now, if we go back, basically my shell script just did that same CF um, services, grepped out if there was a service. If it wasn't there, I would have ran a command called CF. Uh, CS stands for create service. This is the name of the plan, pgemfire, and a small uh, cluster. So if we look at CF, Marketplace. So every time in that ops manager when you add a tile, you're adding services that appear in the marketplace. I really don't have a whole lot in my marketplace, but I do have this P jumpfire. There's my service plans. And you'll see that I'm using this command to set that up. 
Now, you'll also notice I run a command here called cf restart gemfire hero cache cluster config. I've got a zip file and I've got a spring XML. So what does that look like? So we come in here. Uh, it's probably a little small to see my structure, but I have basically just a Maven project. And what I have is a very simple spring XML. Um, so this spring XML is just defining, you'll see I've got a cache. Now, of course, I can come in here and there's all sorts of attributes that I can set. I'm creating an incredibly basic cache here. Cache server, one partition region, which is hero, copies are one. Now, the convention uh, with working with a cluster when it's provisioned by PCF is I need to create a folder called cluster. I gotta have this XML file and any properties files in a jar. And I've got this cluster, lib, and then inside of there is my jar. So I zip that up, and that's what I supply in my restart uh, gemfire command. And I've got the hero cache in there. You can see the cluster. So it basically pushes that up. And then what happens is it distributes across all the members. So all the members briefly go down and come back up, and they have my config. I don't want to do it live because it takes a couple minutes, and I'm already actually slower than I thought. So you get the idea. We've got a running cluster. Now, what's neat is I can work with it. So there's a plugin that you can install, which is the uh, CF, uh, CFCLI Gemfire plugin. I've already installed it. And I can do something like this, show gfish. Whoops, where am I? Mm. Oh. Got a name, what I want to connect to. This is that part where I forget how to type when people are watching. OK. So what this gives me is if you want to connect, so Gfish is yet another shell. And this is a shell I can use to connect to a running Gemfire cluster. So this Cloud Foundry plugin has basically allowed me to ask Cloud Foundry, hey, I know you set up Gemfire for me. Can you give me the credentials I would need so I can connect to it locally with my Gfish and start managing it locally? So if we come here. Going to take that string. Now, I've installed Gemfire on my local machine, which is super easy to do on a Mac. Uh, and there it is. Now, what I'm going to do is just paste in that command, and I'm connected. So I can show, I can list members, I can list regions. I can create regions, I can add entries. So I can basically, from my command line, manage my running cluster. So instead of pushing up that XML, I actually could have done the whole setup after it was created by Cloud Foundry through this, uh, this uh, command line interface. So let's get an app working with it. So I've got two examples that I want to quickly issue through today. Uh, the first of which is, hopefully, is that good size for everyone to see? OK. This is a super simple Spring Boot application. Um, so all it basically does is it has a hash map called um, heroes, and it's got names, and their Twitter handles. And then I've got a very simple REST endpoint. So this REST endpoint takes a name, and it looks up in that map, and it returns a Twitter handle. Super simple. Now, what happens is this get hero that my REST endpoint calls calls a method called expensive lookup, look and you can tell because there's dollar signs in the debugging statement. And that is what does my map. Um, now, picture this as a mainframe or a database that is very expensive to scale and is getting hammered. So picture this as a resource that maybe gets written to very infrequently, but read very frequently, or isn't scaling, something like that. So it's something that we want to protect or insulate with an in-memory cache. But we want to do this kind of quick and easy. So we already know we have a cache set up on, Gemfire, on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So what we want to do is update this app to use that, push it up there, connect them, and then see this in operation. 
Um, so the first thing that I want to do, oh, I already did it. I was going to type that in. That was going to be the extent of my live coding. But yeah, that uh, annotation. So enable caching. Um, now, a couple of sort of housekeeping, just so, and this is all, oops, it's the wrong one. This is all in our GitHub repo, um, which John will share. Here are my cache independencies. So I brought in Spring Boot Starter Cache. I brought in Spring Data Gemfire. And then I brought in two connectors, Spring Cloud Gemfire Spring Connector and Spring Cloud Gemfire Cloud Foundry Connector. So I'm going to need all of these to make this uh, 107 annotation possible and work in Cloud Foundry. So step one was to oops, enable caching. Now step two is, come to that in a second, So I've added an interface called at cacheable cache name hero. So if you remember, we've got a region up in the PCF uh, provision gem fire called hero. So basically saying from my application, so how at cacheable works is if I do a call to get this get hero, uh, that name that gets passed in, it's first going to check the cache to see if it's there, because I've added at cacheable. If there's a miss or a null return, it's going to hit my expensive lookup method, return that, but then it's going to insert it in the cache. So the next time we get hit, it's going to go to the cache instead of my expensive lookup. Now, there is a bit of magic into how this happens. And that is in this configuration. So you notice I have profile cloud, so I can have a profile local if I was hitting my local cluster. In my next example, I'll quickly show that. Profile cloud at configuration. The critical thing here, most important thing, is it uh, extends abstract cloud config. So you got to do that. Now, a couple of key things. The first of which is this one. So you'll see client cache. Now, I'm using the cloud factory. I get a reference. I'm getting a service connector, and I reference Hero cache. Okay? So that is if we go here and we do CF services, I'm hitting that. That is the ID of my gem fire in PCF. So that's what I'm hitting. So Cloud Connector is really smart. It knows how to get a bunch of useful things just given that service ID. The next thing I create is this client region factory bean. Now, generally, the example that John's going to show, he works with Spring Data repositories. Um, I could get a bunch of these, and generally, I would give them a name. And then I would create a POJO in my client cache, cache and there's an at region annotation. And I would reference the bean I'm creating here in my POJO. And then if I create Spring Data repositories, I could just reference that POJO, and it will use this factory bean, and everything just kind of wires together. I didn't give this an ID because I only have one bean, so I'm just letting Spring kind of uh, scan the class path and intelligently auto-wire things together. So if we take a look at this, a string string, it's called hero. So if we take a look inside, hero, that's the name of the region. So this is my local representation of that region that's on PCF. Now the critical thing for at annotation to work is this cache manager. So I basically am pointing it to this client cache that I created. It's of that type. And that makes at cacheable work. Now, um, when I get my service connector, I've got this create jumpfire config. There's nothing in this, but in this little object, I can tune the behavior of the pool. So my client connection, I can set up PDX serialization. I can do all kinds of sort of more advanced jumpfire things. Yes. Um, once you get that reference, you could continue in a generic place. I've just kind of put it all here. Just 
I, I was like, should I live code it? Should I have it in separate files? I thought both would be a disaster, so I thought this was like the fastest way, but definitely, yeah. Perfect. Question? Is that cloud configured is that specific to PCF? Uh, well, um, it's not specific to PCF. If you look at that class, it can actually work with a number of different environments. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's pretty much all I have to do. Uh, I can do a CF push, and I can push this up. So essentially, I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm running low on time. But if you take a look at my manifest, so when you do a CF push, you basically give your binary to Cloud Foundry. It takes a look at it. I've specified a build pack, which is the Java build pack. It talks to the underlying infrastructure. It's got a VM, spins up a container in the VM. A VM. This build pack has sort of all the dependencies to run, puts that in a container, puts my code in, and spins it up, and then starts routing traffic to it from a high level. Now, I have bound a service. So in binding a service, what Cloud Foundry does is it puts, if we take a look at my, so this is the application. So you can see it running in the platform here. See logs. If you go into environmental variables, you'll see I have pgemfire, hero cache, and I've got a bunch of information. So when I bind, that binding in the manifest file is injecting this into the environmental variables, and that cloud connector is really smart about finding that, and that's how it gets the information to actually connect to the cluster. So that's kind of how it all ties together. So let's see it in action, I hope. Okay. So big hero of mine, John. Is that your Twitter handle? <laughs> John underscore Blum. Uh, yep, that is. This program's working great so far. Now, let's take a look at the logs. Should have did that already. Uh, what did I call this? Caching. So what this is going to do is just tail the logs. So I probably missed that last one. That's OK because we can actually see them in the council as well. Oh, no. Other stuff has kind of taken over. So let's try another one. So we'll try another good buddy of mine, Josh. There he is, Starbuck man. And here we go. So here is our expensive lookup, and here is returning our value. So that was the first time through. That was the first time we looked up Josh, so it wouldn't be in the cache. Let's try it again. So it came back, and it takes a second for this to update. And there it is. And there's quite a bit of logging in this. Somewhere in here is it. Now, the other way to check this out is we can go into Pulse. We can go into Data Browser. And we can query that region to see if we are getting the results that we want. Out of memory error. Well, that's nice. <laughs> So you know it's a demo, 100%, because <laughs> like I just did this. <laughs> and you know it's real world because nothing <laughs> works the first time. Okay, thanks for that. Um, let's do. So we'll just bounce the cache. Um, so what I'm going to do is just. So the way the caching abstraction works is, and some of you might already be familiar with that, is that the first time you invoke a method and the value is looked up in the cache and it's not there, it's going to actually invoke the method. Spring proceeds to invoke that method. The next time, subsequently, if the value is there, it's just pulled from the cache and the method invocation is avoided. So. OK. So we'll just bounce our cache. I've been monkeying with it all morning, so who knows what state it's in. So what we're going to do is just reissue that command, sort of rebuild this cache from scratch, re-push up the configs. 
So while that's going on, I'll just quickly show you the other example. Another terminal window here. Yep. OK, so we have another PCF called PCF Dev. So the PCF I was just working on is up in AWS. And you know that's out in the cloud. But what if you want to work locally? So we have something called PCF Dev you can install. Anyone played with that yet? A few people. OK. So what I want to do is get an example running with that. Um, so, so yep. Question. So I'm going to show a little trick for that. So great point. There isn't a tile in PCF Dev for Gemfire. But the other thing I wanted to show with this example is you can work with Gemfire Geode and not have it provisioned by PCF. So I can actually have an app with a Gemfire client in PCF, but the cluster running elsewhere. So that's kind of the other thing I'm, I'm going to demonstrate with this example. But it's true. Uh, that tile um, does not work right now. So. Right now, I'm logged into um, PCF Dev. So that's a PCF running on my local machine. And what I'm going to do is I've got something here called test cluster. So this is going to start a mini cluster on my Mac. So once again, I've got a shell script for this. Um, so you'll notice this one is actually a geode uh, incubating M2. So my little shell script, uh, and you can get this from the GitHub repo, I just did a wget. I brought down the dependencies for um, geode. I, in that shell script, just set my class path and all my variables to point to this. So then when I call gfish from within that script, I'm actually running geode instead of the gem fire that's on my machine. So that's kind of nice. Um, so I'm going to run a file called cluster. So what this is going to do is just on my local geode, start up a couple of locators, a couple of servers, and get something running for me. So everything's starting up. What I'm going to do is start this locally, and then we'll run it in PCF Dev, and, and we'll see it there. And then we'll go back to our other example, and hopefully life is good there. Uh, so we're going to run this. Well, let's look at this caching example, actually, or this events example before I jump into running it. So this is the last thing I want to show, and then I, it's John's turn. I'm going to be like one minute over. OK, cool. I blame that crashing thing. Um, so here's another example. This is a situation where I want to have an app running. I want to connect it to Geode or Gemfire. But I don't want to have to pull or look things up. What I want to do is just connect to the cluster and say, if something changes in the cluster and it matches what I'm interested in, just push it to me. And I'll do something with it. So we call this continuous query. And if you have a spring point of view, implementing a CQ listener or a continuous query listener is just as easy as adding this. So you'll see I've just got a normal class. I've given it the at component CQ listener. And I've defined one event, which is handle event. So I chose a different approach to configuring my cache, my client cache. This time I went with Spring XML. And I bootstrapped this when my Spring Boot application starts up. You'll notice I have a Gemfire pool. I have subscription enabled is equal true. And I have this listener container. And I reference that bean. So what it basically does is it notices that that bean is inside of this CQ listener container. And it implements all the interfaces that that needs for it to work. So when it connects, and you'll notice I have enabled subscriptions, when it connects and my query is met that I registered, this will be called. And this event will contain a collection of every object in the cache that met the query. My query is pretty simple. Select star from customer. So, and all I basically do is just run that. Just system dot out, and I write out that. So if we start this. Started this before I had my cluster started. Okay, so that's running. 
So now what I'm going to do in my connected gfish is I'm going to run a file called data gfish. And if I look at that file, it just does put into this customer region, which incidentally is the one I've registered a query on. So if I run this, there are all my puts, and there is my client implementing its listener. Now what's neat is if I put that into PCF, now I did have to do one change. Um, PCF has very strict uh, networking rules. So I had to create a security group. And in my security group, I gave an IP range allowance for where my locator of my cluster is running, the IP ports of where my cluster is running. So when I push this application up to PCF, it actually will allow traffic to come in and out towards those ports. Out of the box, PCF actually won't allow what I'm going to do, but you can create a security rule using the CLI command line to, to allow for it. Um, so let's see it. And then we'll check back on that, and that doesn't work. So we'll just tail the logs on what's running in PCF dev. So this is that application that I've done a push to PCF dev. And in my manifest file for the CF push, I didn't really do anything. I've just pushed the jar up that I reviewed with you guys, and I've specified the build pack. Now the key little bit of magic here is in the main method for Spring Boot, I'm importing that resource. So the first thing the application does when it starts up is it bootstraps itself into the cluster, registers my listener, all that kind of good stuff. So now, it'll go back to this. So since I already have a cluster running, I can just say connect. I'm going to run data. So we do some puts. And we come over here. And that is tailing from what's running in PCF. So what's neat there is I had an application running in PCF that was connected to a Gemfire cluster elsewhere, had that listener configured. Something changed in that Gemfire cluster, and all those objects were pushed into my PCF running application. And I did something with it. So we have a geode sample called Fast Foot Shoes. And what we do is we connect CQ listeners to WebSockets and update UIs. So events come in, and we use WebSockets and, and AJAX to actually update a JavaScript UI. So you can see your UI changing based on what gets pushed to your application. Real quick question. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you went pretty fast. I'm not sure I'm tracking exactly what you're doing. You spun uh -oh. up a Gemfire instance in your PCF dev, and you had the real PCF talk back to No, no. So I spun up a Geode instance on my laptop, right. and then I pushed um, an application into PCF, PCF dev, PCF. which is like a fake PCF running on my machine. And that's how the two of them okay. connected, yeah. And I used up all my Amazon capacity installing my PCF. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have had it running on Amazon, and I would have connected them like that. Cool. Uh, my boss is going to freak when he sees the bill. All right. So let's just hit this endpoint a little bit, and we'll see if we're happy in terms of the cache getting updated. And then let's come over here. Oh, God, I got to go. Yeah, something's up with that. Well, trust me, it works. <laughs> so it, uh, you would see every time I hit one of those endpoints after the expensive method, you would see the results showing up in the cache. So I'm not sure exactly why it's uh, running out of memory. Maybe my VMs have been a little bit hammered too much in the preparation for this. I 
unfortunately couldn't give it as much capacity as it actually needs, so that's, that's probably the problem. But that gives you an idea, and I'll hand it over to John. Thank you, Luke. All right. How many people have actually used the Spring Data Repository abstraction? Great. So some of these concepts will be already familiar to you. Um, and we'll kind of recap those. So my computer to come back up. All right. So it'll be a slight review, and then for the people who have never seen this before, hopefully um, it'll be insightful. So in order to make sense out of the repository abstraction, I created a little application, simple contacts application. Um, for instance, I've modeled the contact here for a person, so it has a reference to a person object. It also has an ID, but more importantly has references to person's address, their phone number, email address, that sort of thing. And then there's a bunch of, um, you know, factory methods and other slight little DSL in here to help me, like, kind of build up some things pretty quickly. Um, but that's the gist of my little application. Now, I want to, you know, obviously store data and retrieve that information back out. And then I might want to search on it in kind of unique ways. I want to look up my contact information, maybe by email address, phone number, that sort of thing. So I've created this little test, and right now it's showing some red because we're going to my plan was to create some classes, so I'm going to see how quickly I can move through this. So we have time for questions at the end. But anyway, um, I have an already existing test in there. In order to get going on the repository abstraction, uh, let me expand this a little bit so it's a little easier to read. I'm just going to create a repo for my contacts. Well, before I do that, just just back up one second. So the, the things that are important on a, an actual model object when you want to persist it to GEMFAR is sometimes maybe you want to like map the object to a different region. So you can use the at region annotation to specify the region in which this information is going to go into. The region is just a simple key value store here. So it's going to persist the information for the ID of this contact to the value, which is the contact itself. This is not absolutely necessary. If I don't specify that region annotation, it just uses the simple name of the class to refer to the region. But what is important is the ID uh, specification. So I have the at ID annotation here to indicate what the key value is for the key value store. You also see that there's a Java X annotation there for ID. That's used for JPA, and in my example here, we're going to actually persist this contact to both a database as well as Gemfire in the transaction example. So, all right. So let's create the repository. So I want to kind of walk through this and show you how easy it is to really get going. So I'm going to create a repository here, which is an interface. Hopefully my typing works okay. All right. So there's, in the repository abstraction, there's different interfaces that you can implement. You can just actually implement the repository interface, which is just a shell, it's a marker interface. So that lets you pick and choose which operations you want to expose. If you don't want to expose any mutation operations, like create or update, then you don't put those in your repository interface or remove. You just put the ones that you want in there, and those are the only ones that get exposed. I'm just going to extend the Gemfire repository, which comes from Spring Data Gemfire, or Spring Data Geode. And we're going to persist contacts, and the ID on that was a long. And just by doing that, I've actually got a data access object that will actually create information, allow you to read it back out with simple finder methods, update it, delete it. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was define that interface. But before I can actually get the repository abstraction going, I need a configuration. So let's create a configuration. And I believe I called it demo app config. And we're going to store that in demo app. Config. Now all of these, all this what I'm doing right now is already actually pre-built. Um, I just want to kind of walk through it so that kind of shows how quickly you can actually get something running. So the first thing I need to do is specify, specify this as an at configuration class. I'm going to enable Gemfire repositories. And I'm going to give it the location of where the repository is. If you don't give it a location, it's just going to scan down from the location that the at configuration annotation has been added. 
when it does the component scan, it's going to pull in all repositories. In this particular case, I just wanted to pull in a specific repository. So base package classes, contact repository. And in this case, we're using the demo one dot class. Okay. And then we also need some Gemfire configuration. So I've already got a pre-built Gemfire configuration class to basically enable Gemfire. And you can use either XML or Java config. My preference is to use Java config. And we'll quickly just take a look at what that looks like here in order to actually bootstrap Gemfire. Now it's kind of involved and my my surprise feature actually pertains to how we can simplify this a little bit. But essentially what you need to do is you need to create a cache, right? first and foremost. In this particular case, we're creating a peer cache because we're using the cache factor bean. If you want a client cache, you would use the client cache factor bean. But we're creating the cache here and we're, we're specifying some Gemfire system properties, giving the node a name and setting the log level. There are a lot of other system properties that you can use. And then we're creating our contacts region. This is where the actual information for my application is going to be stored. In this particular case, it's a partition region. There's different data management policies in Gemfire, replicate, partition. Partition is closely related to sharding, so it distributes your data across all the nodes in the cluster. But in my particular example, I'm only going to have one node, so there's going to be no sharding involved. But typically, you would have multiple nodes, and you want to set your redundancy level so that it would basically create duplicates, which actually increases your read throughput and lowers your latency. We'll come back to this configuration later. So over here, I do believe that, um, all right, so my demo app config there is good. I actually put my repository in the wrong location. So let me just move that real quick. Oops, dot repo. All okay. And I called it demo contact repository. All right, demo contact repository. Yes. Okay. Now we've got green. Good. So with that, I have a simple test that basically shows how information can be saved, retrieved, and then deleted. So I have my contact repository here. I create a contact first, I save it, I retrieve it by its ID. It's not the same instance because when you put it into a partition region, it actually serializes it. So when it comes back out, it's literally a different instance object. Um, but Gemfire will remember whatever you pass it in as. So if you've deserialized it as an object, it'll store it in the region as an object going forward until it needs to be serialized again, which is the case if it's replicated between either peers or between the client and server. And then I just go ahead and I delete it. So let's run that. Oops. I move refactoring didn't work. And that's demo contact repository. Yes? No? Typo? Oh, yes, sorry. There we go. Okay. Not, don't quite have the Josh Long finesse here. <laughs> <laughs> Demo app repo, where did I go wrong here? Demo uh, contact repository. No? Do I still have a typo? Oh, okay. Shoot. Yeah, of course. Uh, source demo. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why it was complaining earlier. So let me just uh, delete that real fast and re add it. Shoot. Delete it anyway. All right. Java class. Demo. repository and demo 
app dot repo. Okay. My apologies. Yes. So this is an interface, of course. Extends Gemfire repository. Contact. Well, okay. Okay. Demo app, demo app config. Whoa. Okay. Um, apparently, I already had that. That's fine. That should be fine. All right. To the test. Great. Red bars. Let's just make sure this runs now. It is a Spring Boot application. It's using the Spring, te Spring Boot test annotations to find it. Great. So now our repository abstraction works here. So I might want to be able to find by email address, so I can create a test for that, right? To save a little bit of time, I'm just going to copy from my test. Oops. So it's just going to create a contact, and it's going to look this person up by their email address. I might want to find them by phone number. So a phone number is a complex object on the contact itself, but the repository abstraction still allows you to do that. Find by phone number. Okay. I got some helper factory methods here that I can import. So let's create those in the repository. I'm just going to grab the names for the sake of time. So in the email case, maybe it's you know sort of unique, so I don't have to actually return a list. And then the phone number, well, multiple people might live at the same address. Find by phone number, phone number. Okay. All right. He's imported. And now we're good. And we can run that. And those particular repository methods should work. So the way Spring Data Repositories works, it works by convention. So it looks at the method name and forms a query from that. So if you follow the convention, you can get very simple query semantics. Now, you can actually query by nested objects. Maybe I want to find by a person's address, but I want to look at maybe all the people in a particular city and state. So how would that look? So I might have a list of contacts that come back because multiple people can live at the same address. Find by person, find by address, city, and address, state. Now the interesting thing about the state is that it's an enum type. So Spring Data knows how to translate between different types, enums being one of them. Okay. Let me move this guy out of the way. So now I have a search by a nested object and properties on that object. So the convention is this is the nested object portion. This is the attribute or property on that particular object. And I have a join there condition or multiple um, clauses in my where clause. So in this particular case, I have two people, and they live in different locations, and I want to maybe just pull back one of them, maybe one person from Las Vegas, Nevada, for instance. I can run that. I expect one to come back, and I expect that person to be Joe Dirt. OK. Pretty simple. Let's get into some more advanced queries, like maybe finding by name. And there's different combinations of things we can do to find by a person's name. For instance, we might just look them up by last name. We might look them up by first and last name, uh, like a particular um, value. So using a wildcard search, Gemfire's wildcard or Geode's wildcard is the percent symbol. I might even want to sort on that so I can actually specify a sort parameter. Let's uh, add those to the repository. We 
Again, pulling by last name, generally you're going to find more than one. String last name. Okay, like. So this would be our wildcard case. And of course we added one for, or not yet. There's different ways in which you can sort, so let me uh, put that in there real quick for that test. Um, oops. Actually, I did that backwards. No. Well, this particular example actually demonstrates how to do it by ignoring case. The one above it uses the wild card, and the one before it actually just searched directly by the last name. And I thought I had one more in there for... Uh, uh, maybe not. This is a different example. Okay, so let's put this one in there as well. List of contacts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I need to add a sort parameter up here in this particular case. But if I don't want to do that, I can actually use the convention. and actually have it within the method name itself. In this particular case, I use both first name and last name. Okay, so there we go. And that's all green again. We should be able to run that. And that should work. I'm gonna show one more complex query and then uh, demo a few other features. So what if we want to find by a person's age? The person actually has name, date of birth, gender on it. So um, the age is actually a calculated thing. So even though it's not an actual property of the object, it's an actual method invocation, the query engine in Gemfire can invoke that when the query is executed and determine what the value is and use it in queries. So again, I'm getting back a list of contacts. He's an age. Oops. The parameter names don't really matter. Unless you're using Spring Data Rust, in which case they might. All right. So we do again have green. So it, essentially, it's just find by the person's age greater than a particular value. Maybe I want all my friends that are older than a certain age. And I'm going to order them by last name ascending and their age descending. So I can express that right in the method itself. Again, I'm not doing any OQL here. Gemfire's query language is OQL. I'm just using the repository abstraction to express my queries. So again, this will work. OK, so good. Now, I can do other things that are actually Gemfire specific. So the repository abstraction is giving me a lot of the convention out of the box, but each query language has its own extensions, right? I can have things like, well, if you look at Oracle's SQL, for instance, in the way that you do outer joins, very unique. Doesn't, it both supports ANSI standard, but also has its own syntax. Well, OQL has some extensions as well. Like, for instance, I can set a limit on my information. So to support some of those extensions, you can do it by way of annotations. In this particular test, essentially I had three results coming back, because I had three people that were older than the age of 21. And of course, they were sorted. So Joe Dirk came first, because his last name Obviously, it appears first in ascending order. And then the other two people appear in descending order based on their age. But if I limit that query to only return one, I would expect this test to fail. Also, I can add things like at trace annotation. So in order to enable debugging for a particular query, I can now add this at trace annotation and log just that query. Before, in Gemfire, you'd have to set a system property that was global, and it would log all your queries. And if you have a lot of queries, it's going to be really hard to find the one you want without you know, some kind of um, search. So I can do that. I can actually add index hints, right? If I have an index created, which I do, we're not going to look at the definition of that, and so on. So if I run that, I would expect the one test to fail. I would also expect to see some logging for my email um, query. OK, so our one failed because it returned one. It limited it to one, but the original thing was three. Um, if we look down here in the logs, the very end, well, not quite the very end, 
believe it's right here. All right, there we go. You can see that it traced the query. Here's the actual query that it generated, the OQL. Oops, my apologies. So you can see the query that it generated. It actually uses the parameters from the query method to actually fill in the query as, property, as placeholders. And you can see uh, on the next line or a couple lines below, the index that it used. It actually used my email index, right? So it would hopefully substantially increase your query speed. So just with a few simple annotations on that repository, I'm able to achieve quite a bit, right? I can make, do quite a bit. However, what happens if you have a really complex query, like you have two regions, you want to co-locate them, join the information. If I have a partition region and I want to join across two regions, first of all, in a distributed data grid, they have to be co-located, especially if they're partition regions. A replicated region, your data is replicated all across the nodes. All the nodes contain all the data. In a partition region, in sharding, the region only contains a subset of your data. So in order to join them, first they have to be co-located. And there's also another gotcha. So let's add a query from that. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste that now. It's also working across multiple domain objects, and a repository is usually tied to one domain object. So um, in this particular instance, you'd have to use the at query annotation to actually express this um, particular query. You can't express this through the convention. So Spring Data Gemfire supports that, and the way it does that is using the at query annotation. So if you absolutely have to, you can use the at query annotation to specify your query if it isn't supported by the convention. So if I run, if I create a test for that now, okay, so we got age, all right, oops, that's not the right one. Find. In this particular case, what we, want, what we want to do is we have two regions now. We're going to actually persist a customer that has contact information. Maybe we have leads, right? We want to find all of the contacts or all the customers who have contact information. So I create a customer. I also have a customer repository in this particular case. It's already created. Actually, what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna switch my configuration back to my actual configuration that I'm using for this demo because it involves some other magic that builds on the repository abstraction. That'll also create my customer repository for me. And I'm also gonna switch my contact repository to the completed example here. And one more thing in my configuration because I've actually enabled other services, I don't have to define this dependency between the regions. It's kind of automatically set up for me. And hopefully that will break. Okay, but why did it break? Gemfire throws an exception on a, on a partitioned region because your data is sharded Therefore, you need some kind of distributed compute to actually pull all that data in and uh, um, aggregate it, right? So you can't do this outside of a function context. So another feature of the um, repository abstraction is I can actually define an interface that actually has a method on it that will actually, I provide the implementation for. So instead of relying on the um, the default implementation, the proxy that gets built in the default implementation, I can actually provide the implementation. And it's really as simple as defining, oops, my apologies. It's really as simple as defining an interface, customer repository extension interface, and providing an implementation for that. So in this particular case, I've actually used another feature of Spring Data Gemfar, the function annotation support. So it actually imports a function execution which executes on a region, and the implementation for that is execute query in function context. So I'm actually using Gemfire's API in this particular case to actually get the query service off the region, use the query, so the same query we had on a repository abstraction, right? 
and then execute it. And inside the function, it's going to take that and distribute that across the cluster. So all the clusters, all the nodes in the cluster are going to execute that particular query and return the results. So I've used Spring Data Repository's custom extension along with Querion to, uh, or excuse me, along with the um, Gemfire function annotations to be able to actually do this particular query. So back in my test, I can switch these out with the customer repository now. And this should work. So the customer repository just is a repository just like the contacts repository. And it defines the um, CRUD operations for the customer. And it also defined my, my complex query that tied together the, the function interface to actually execute that query. So building on that repository abstraction, you can do both, right? You can combine the um, um, querying with custom repositories and function execution and achieve what you want. All right, so we're, we're really out of time here. I'm gonna jump back to my slides real quick and then we can take questions offline before the next person presents. So unfortunately, I didn't get to go to my bonus example. We kind of ran over there. Apologies. So if you want to start using Spring Data Gemfire Geode now, you can just define the dependency in your um, Palm XML files, your Gradle build file, either for Spring Data Gemfire or Spring Data Geode, and it'll pull in all the dependencies you need, both Gemfire and Geode. You can also use the Spring Boot Starter to actually get started. And we had some things coming up uh, that we wanted to present uh, in terms of what was next, but we're going to skip those. And you can find all this information online. I'm going to post these, tw uh, these slides to my Twitter account. You can get the slides and click these links. It'll take you where you want to go. And um, that's pretty much it. To stay connected, so Oliver Girk's going to give a presentation uh, later today on Spring Data Rust, which is going to actually go into more detail on how you can take your repositories and make them restful. Apologize we didn't get to that example today. And if you have any questions, like I said, come up and see me afterwards. And thank you for attending.